Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to episode number 138 of Chamber TV. My name is Lori White, and I'm the president of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. And today we have a very informative uh, 60 minutes lined up for you. And today we're going to be talking about the federal infrastructure bills slash bill and uh, getting a handle on where we are in the budget approval process, the reconciliation process, what the bipartisan legislation looks like. We're going to talk about the differences between hard and soft infrastructure. And we have a subject matter expert with us uh, today, none other than a senior advisor uh, to the U.S. Department of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. But before I get into it, I do want to uh, thank Congressman Jim Langevin and his entire team for working with us over the course of the last several weeks to um, connect us with uh, the Department of Transportation, U.S. Department of Transportation, and all of those folks uh, that are working so diligently on the ground now that the Senate uh, has a bill that it is working on. So at this point, um, I would like to formally welcome our speaker today, Maurice Henderson. And Maurice is senior advisor to USDOT uh, uh, department head uh, Pete Buttigieg. And I'd also like to formally recognize the chair of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce uh, Transportation Committee, Anthony DiMatteo and Anthony is a uh, business development uh, senior executive with Dimeo Construction. So I'm gonna to toss it over to uh, Anthony to say a few words on behalf of our uh, transportation committee, and then we will formally hear from our distinguished guest. Thank you, Lori. Uh, welcome, Maurice. It's nice to meet you this afternoon. We appreciate your time. I know you're very, very busy and have a lot on your agenda. Um, let me just make a few comments on behalf of our committee as part of the chamber. Um, as a member of the Providence Chambers Transportation Subcommittee, we conduct regular meetings to assure our local and interested regional businesses and community stakeholders are informed, as well as have opportunities to ask questions and raise ideas on issues and ongoing development affecting Rhode Island's transportation infrastructure. We regularly cover uh, various local and regional topics affecting our transportation systems, having engaged guest speakers such as Rhode Island Department of Transportation Commissioner Peter Albedi, speaking to roadworks and infrastructure improvements throughout Rhode Island, Rhode Island Airport Corporation President Iftikhar Ahmad on developments at Rhode Island airports and at TF Green, Rhode Island Public Transportation Authority Director Scott Avedigian, and in particular discussions around the new Providence bus hub, Rhode Island's growing port president presence with Prop Ports Chris Watterson and growth at Quonset Davisville with Mr. Stephen King, the director of that development. Along with our federal delegation, most notably Senator Jack Reed and Sheldon Whitehouse. Our entire chamber constituency is very interested in hearing from you on the latest development related to the infrastructure investment and gaining perhaps further insights on how our state of Rhode Island may be affected and benefit. Thank you for your time and meeting with us this afternoon. Lori. Thank you uh, very much, Anthony. And you will be back uh, shortly to uh, help lead a series of questions uh, with Maurice. But let me uh, formally introduce Maurice Henderson. He was appointed by the Biden administration as a senior advisor to the 19th U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. He is, as I mentioned, a subject matter expert, has worked both domestically and internationally in the public and private sectors, as well as on a number of political and advocacy campaigns. Prior to his appointment, he worked as senior director of U.S. government partnerships at the transportation technology startup Bird Rides. So we are very fortunate to have uh, Maurice with us today. He has been on the ground, deeply immersed in the infrastructure discussions, and we are very pleased to be able to welcome him to Chamber TV today. So Maurice, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Lori and, and Anthony. I appreciate the, the invitation from the Chamber. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Uh, as Lori mentioned, uh, my name is Maurice Henderson, sort of a senior advisor to Secretary Buttigieg. 
uh, you know, I'll just say as a, a matter of um, connection, I'm a New England kid, uh, grew up in uh, Cambridge, Mass and Andover, Mass, uh, and spent my many of my summers in, uh, in Newport, Rhode Island and, and uh, uh, Portsmouth, where much of my family on my father's side is. So uh, very, very much aware of the, um, the beauty uh, and history of, of New England and particularly in Rhode Island and really um, privileged and, and honored to be able to connect with you all today. Uh, so I know that the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the INVEST Act, uh, the American Jobs Plan, all, all of these things that have been uh, moving over the last uh, several weeks and months are of great interest uh, to you and your membership. And, and so I'm gonna take a hopefully a few minutes and, and sort of give you uh, a crash course as it were, and, and, and what the conversations have been in, in Washington and across the country. Uh, I can certainly tell you that uh, uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris and the entire administration are deeply committed uh, to these notions of uh, the Build Back Better uh, plan and uh, this once in a generation, not once in a century uh, investment that's been proposed through the president's uh, American Jobs Plan and American's Family Plan, and then the subsequent uh, bipartisan uh, infrastructure framework that you've been hearing so much about in, in the most recent weeks uh, is really the construct of, of uh, much of the conversation that, that will probably be happening in the next couple of weeks over in uh, in the U.S. Senate. Um, so just to, to, to back up a, a bit, you know, we all started this year uh, after a really tumultuous and trying uh, 2020 uh, with, with the COVID pandemic. And, and as you know, the president uh, made sure that that his administration, that the, the Biden-Harris administration was focused on uh, getting the American people uh, strengthened, stood up in, in, in a position of resilience to, to manage uh, life after the experience of, of uh, the pandemic in full, in full force last year. So the, the president uh, worked uh, diligently with, with cabinet members, with members of the Senate and the House to try to come to bipartisan agreement on what was called the American Rescue Plan. And, you know, as, as you all know, it was uh, voted uh, pretty much on party lines, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the American people uh, have received uh, close to $1.9 trillion in relief. Much of that has gone directly to uh, localities and states, small businesses, uh, to try to ensure that we were in a position uh, to make that recovery uh, as quickly as possible. And, and the president has continued his commitment to ensure that Americans um, are getting shots in arms and, and checks in, in pockets. And I think you've probably seen the news recently that uh, some of the uh, child income tax credit dollars are starting, those first checks are starting to roll out now. Uh, the, the, the second piece is, as the president had uh, campaigned on was about his build back better agenda. So as we know, um, the American uh, Society of Civil Engineers every year for the last several years has, has gone out and graded um, both the, the national infrastructure, but also giving you a breakdown state by state. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later as it uh, pertains to, to Rhode Island. Um, for the most part, uh, that grade has, has hovered somewhere between, you know, a C plus and just above an F, um, which obviously as the, you know, uh, the global leader uh, in so many ways, uh, that's just not acceptable. That's not something that uh, the American people deserve. And that's certainly something that uh, the Biden-Harris administration uh, are committed to changing and making sure that, uh, that that grade, hopefully, while it may be, quote, arbitrary in some ways, um, is something that is really reflective of how we are thinking about our investments in infrastructure. And so the president, back in March, as you may recall, um, uh, out of Pittsburgh, announced his uh, American jobs plan uh, and then subsequently his American family plan. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and debate around what quote is infrastructure, hard infrastructure versus soft infrastructure. Uh, and, I, and I would say fast forwarding to the last uh, several weeks of discussion between uh, the White House and the administration uh, and members of, of, of Congress, we've seen now this bipartisan framework that has come out of the, uh, what was the gang of, uh, of 21 um, and that's been uh, framed as the, the bipartisan infrastructure framework. And so I'll give you sort of a snapshot on, on what that looks like. Uh, obviously, the president 
strongly endorsed um, the, the BIF, as we're calling it, or I'll refer to it as the framework for the purposes of our discussion today. Um, this would uh, reflect the, the largest long-term investment in our, uh, in our infrastructure uh, and competitiveness in nearly a century. Uh, this investment in, um, quote, the traditional sort of infrastructure will make our economy more uh, sustainable, resilient, and, and just. Um, this $1.2 trillion bipartisan investment over an eight-year period uh, is critical, uh, as I referred to, in, in uh, achieving the president's uh, vision of building back better here for the, the American people. Uh, the plan makes uh, transformational and historic investments in, uh, in clean transportation infrastructure, uh, clean water infrastructure, uh, universal broadband infrastructure, uh, clean power infrastructure, uh, re remediation of, of legacy pollution issues, and resilience to uh, changing climate. Uh, and simultaneously, um, it cuts across all of these areas. And, and uh, as I mentioned, while you know the negotiations are happening and the discussions are, are hot and heavy now, while the president get, did not um, necessarily get everything that he had proposed in the original $2.3 uh, trillion American jobs plan, uh, I think it's I think the numbers around two thirds is, is how the, the White House and CBO are grading it. About two thirds of what the president has proposed um, is actually reflected in uh, the framework, the bipartisan uh, infrastructure framework. Uh, and so I'll, I'll get into some of the um, specifics around that in, in a moment. Um, but I think it's important to to also call out that at this moment, uh, the president has has you know sort of set a mark and talked about how this uh, discussion around the framework uh, is one that, that shows the inflection point that we are as, an, uh, as a democracy. And that at this moment in history, uh, President Biden believes that we must demonstrate to the world, and quote, quoting him, we must demonstrate to the world that uh, the American democracy can deliver for the American people. Uh, today, the president is showing that democracy can deliver results uh, the framework will position American workers, farmers, and businesses, uh, small and large alike, to compete uh, and win the 21st century. And, and uh, in that statement, what I'm alluding to is whether or not uh, more autocratic or dictatorial uh, regimes and, and the way that they um, get to investment and, and, and funding for critical things like infrastructure uh, is the, the new path forward or whether... Um, this, this great American experiment um, uh, is, is one that can continue, continue to produce results uh, for the American people. And, and obviously we uh, in the Biden-Harris administration and, and at USDOT believe strongly uh, in the, the president's vision and in American uh, democracy to deliver on the promises and the values of the American people. Um, so to continue, uh, in the bipartisan framework, uh, just to give you some specifics around uh, what goes into uh, the traditional infrastructure that's been focused on in this particular bill. Uh, you know, the president set out a broad agenda around infrastructure, uh, including uh, roads, bridges, tunnels, ports, airports, waterways, uh, as I mentioned, uh, ensuring that, you know, our coastlines were more resilient, et cetera, but also looking uh, with an eye towards uh, the climate impacts that we've all seen. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as it pertains to Rhode Island, but certainly we've seen, um, you know, I'm currently right now in uh, in Bend, Oregon, in Central Oregon. So climate fires have been a major issue for, for us here in the Pacific Northwest. Obviously we've seen uh, torrential downpours, flooding, uh, hurricanes, uh, extreme weather events like the ones we saw in Texas earlier this year, where we saw so many of our uh, fellow Americans living in, in, in literally third world conditions, having to uh, melt snow to try to get fresh fresh water for their houses to, to just flush the toilet. Um, so those are things that, you know, you would think are unthinkable, but but it's happening real time in front of us and the investments that the, the president is proposing, the investments that uh, he is negotiating along with the entire administration uh, on, on behalf of the American people are also focused on delivering uh, cleaner, uh, innovative solutions that also create good paying jobs uh, that will support uh, living wage um, 
uh, or a living wage workforce in communities across the country. So, uh, you know, I, I know people always want to know what the numbers are. So, so let's dig in a little bit on the numbers. Um, so in the, the bipartisan framework, uh, which again is over a, an eight year period, the first tranche um, would be about 579 billion. Uh, the president initially, as I mentioned earlier, proposed about $2.3 trillion uh, in the transportation space, which I know is, uh, is relevant to, to this particular group. Uh, the the um, original proposal from the American Jobs Plan was about $620 billion uh, in this bipartisan uh, framework. Uh, it's about $312 billion. And how that breaks down, I won't get into every single line item, but just for the, the top lines, uh, for uh, roads, bridges, and major projects, it's about $110 billion in the bipartisan framework. The president initially had uh, proposed about 115 billion. So uh, clearly, um, you know, I wouldn't say decimal dust, but but certainly um, those those numbers align pretty closely uh, around in, improving safety on our roadways. Uh, the president originally uh, uh, endorsed a plan around about a 20 billion dollar investment there. Um, the bipartisan uh, framework. Uh, suggests about 11 billion. Uh, in, in fact, uh, earlier this week, I was with Secretary Buttigieg and uh, uh, Transportation Infrastructure House uh, Chair uh, Pierre DeFazio from here in Oregon, uh, in Corvallis, Oregon, and Springfield slash Eugene, Oregon, uh, visiting uh, a couple of sites where safety improvements have been made in, in, in response, unfortunately, uh, to the tragic uh, losses that we, we've seen on our roadways. And as I, I think all of you know, we lose about 35 to, to 40,000 Americans every year on our roadways uh, in, in, in traffic related uh, crashes and incidents. And, and that's just an, an un unacceptable number. Um, in any other context, uh, we would call that an, an epidemic. Um, and, and for whatever reason, as a society, it's something that, that we have, have not struggled with in the ways that, that you would think um, the leading country in the world would. But I think the, the president and vice president, and certainly the, the secretary and, and, and Chairman DeFazio and others are very committed to seeing sort of this vision zero concept where zero deaths or serious injuries happen um, on our roadways through, through design, enforcement, education, et cetera, and investment. Um, in terms of, of public transit, um, which I know has been a subject of much debate. The president originally had proposed about 85 billion in the American Jobs Plan uh, in the bipartisan uh, framework. Uh, the number that has been uh, 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 arrived at at 49 billion is actually the largest investment that we've made in transit um, in, in, a, in a generation. Uh, and in terms of passenger rail at 66 billion from the bipartisan framework, that would be the largest investment since uh, the creation of Amtrak. Uh, the president had proposed about $80 billion. Um, another piece that I that I alluded to uh, is this, this, this notion of the move towards uh, electrifying not only the grid, but certainly electrifying um, the vehicles that we drive, potentially light, uh, light duty vehicles, trucks and, and cars. Uh, as you know, the United States is one of the uh, great contributors to um, uh, carbon uh, in our atmosphere, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and transportation is the largest contributor to that um, in the country. And so the president had, had proposed a very ambitious $174 billion uh, towards um, uh, EV conversion. So that was in uh, promotion of sales and rebates um, EV infrastructure, et cetera. Um, while the, the, the EV number is a bit more, um, is a, a, a slightly smaller at seven and a half billion, uh, in the bipartisan framework. Uh, there are also other programs, um, in other places around infra and other things that, that we're doing here at the department. And certainly you have to also include the work that the EPA, uh, our friends at Commerce and at Energy are doing. So, you know, if you look at that cumulatively, uh, the investments across uh, the whole of government, as, as the president likes to say, uh, are quite significant when it comes to uh, moving uh, the American um, transportation system in terms of, of, of how we get around uh, towards an electrified future that's, that's heavily reliant on uh, renewable uh, renewable energy. Um, 
related to that, the president uh, also in the negotiation around the, the, the framework has come up with about seven and a half billion that's being proposed uh, to move towards uh, electric buses um, related to transit as well as school bus conversion. Um, he had originally proposed about 50,000 school buses that would be converted to uh, EV buses. And in fact, during that, during that trip, the, the secretary took uh, earlier this week um, out here in Oregon, uh, he went to go visit one of the uh, transit facilities that now has, I believe, uh, the country's largest uh, full EV bus uh, BRT out in uh, the Lane, uh, Lane County District, uh, Transit District. Uh, and so we were able to, to visit with, with the team there, uh, get, you know, get a tutorial, actually allowed the, the secretary and, uh, and chair to actually uh, drive the buses in an in, enclosed environment. Um, uh, had a good time, learned a lot, and, and certainly uh, look forward to seeing more investments like that across the country. And certainly as the DOT, we are doing everything we can through through our grant making uh, abilities to support uh, communities and, and transit authorities and, and, and metropolitan areas and their conversion towards uh, electric vehicles. Uh, another piece that I know is critically important and I know um, Providence is, 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 is certainly a major hub um, in terms of airport investment. Uh, the president initially uh, proposed $25 billion uh, for upgrades of, of airports, big and small, uh, concessionaires, et cetera, uh, runways. Um, the bipartisan framework actually meets that number at $25 billion. The, the, uh, the members of the Gang of 21 also agreed in the importance of that particular funding number and level. Uh, and so we hope to continue to see that uh, stay as the uh, negotiations proceed over the coming uh, days and weeks. Uh, another piece that I mentioned is uh, Rhode Island is, is, is coastal. Um, as a kid from Massachusetts and, all, and now living in Oregon, um, the uh, investment in our ports and waterways is critically important. I know that's also true for many parts of, of uh, the South and, and uh, central parts of the country. Uh, so the president had originally proposed about $17 billion in, in uh, investment there. Bipartisan framework outlines about $16 billion. So again, very close uh, in number. Uh, another uh, piece that I, that I think is uh, critically important, um, you know, the president ha had proposed about $100 billion in making uh, broadband uh, more accessible and affordable uh, in both uh, rural and urban communities throughout the country. Uh, given, you know, as we were, as I was talking about earlier, given the impact of the pandemic, um, you know, we saw very clearly um, how desperate that impact affects different communities, uh, particularly communities of concern, communities of color, low income communities throughout the country. Uh, and, and so the president has uh, set a target uh, and a goal uh, for seeing uh, uh, broadband uh, near in, in near ubiquity uh, throughout the country at a hundred billion dollar level. Uh, the, the bipartisan framework came back a little bit lower than that at 65 billion, but clearly uh, still uh, indicating a, 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 a necessity uh, for seeing that investment happen. Uh, obviously, a, a number of, of uh, children across the country uh, were not in a position to fully uh, in, engage in, in schooling because of um, the pandemic, because of the lack of, of access to broadband. And that's something that the president is committed to changing in the future. And, and I think that based on what the bipartisan framework has, has laid out, uh, we should be on a really strong footing there. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll point out, and then I'll get, and then I'll drill down into um, what's going on in Rhode Island, um, uh, was the the focus on resilience. And, and because of uh, what we've seen, whether it's, um, you know, Sandy or Ivan or, you know, Katrina some years back, uh, resiliency, uh, the climate, as I mentioned, the climate fires out here in the West, uh, resilience is, is something that um, seems to be a, a, a nonpartisan issue. I think there's a recognition uh, that we need to strengthen um, our communities, that we need to make them more resilient, more self-sufficient in many ways. The president had proposed uh, an ambitious $50 billion. And in the bipartisan framework that was worked out, uh, they've come back with about $47 billion. So, so clearly, uh, the issue of resilience uh, and strengthening our communities is something that is front and center uh, for both the president and for the congressional uh, leaders. And so we appreciate uh, you know, their vision and, and support uh, for funding at that level.
Uh, so overall, uh, in new spending over over baseline, over five years, this would be about $973 billion. Uh, over eight years, as I mentioned, uh, this would represent about $1.2 uh, trillion in new spending as part of the, the bipartisan infrastructure framework. Um, and so let, let's um, drill down a little bit more and, and, and focus on uh, the great state of Rhode Island. Um, you know, for, for decades, um, Rhode Island, like so many, the other states across the country uh, has has suffered from a lack of um, investment in in its infrastructure, um, and that is that is not a that's not a um, uh, that's not calling out the the state DOT or the local um, uh, public works officials. Uh, you know, I, I used to uh, be a a, a local uh, public servant. Uh, in Portland and Washington DC serving as the, the deputy director for transportation. So I understand the trade-offs that are being made all the time around, uh, you know, whether it's base repair or full replacement uh, versus just, just, you know, keeping, keeping things moving. Um, those are, those are big decisions. Those are big investments. Um, those are big, big calls that have to be made. Uh, and the president recognizes that, that cities and localities and states are struggling uh, to find the resources to be able to to quote build back better, and so he's proposed, uh, you know, in his framework, as I mentioned, a, a large investment in in roads and bridges and tunnels. Uh, in the bipartisan framework, uh, there's also a recognition of this. Um, you know, as I alluded to earlier, the um, uh, American Society of Civil Engineers uh, provided, I believe, the grade this year for the American infrastructure was a a D range. Uh, for Rhode Island, uh, it was a C minus uh, coming into this year, and so what what does that what does that look like in terms of how the bipartisan framework uh, would support uh, critical investment in infrastructure in Rhode Island? Uh, so in terms of repair for uh, roads and bridges, uh, climate mitigation, uh, resilience, equity, etc., uh, you guys have about 148 bridges across the state. 860 miles of, of highway that is in poor uh, condition. Uh, just as, as a comparator, uh, your neighboring uh, your neighbors in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, my my home, uh, you know, 472 bridges, uh, about 1,194 miles of, of highway in, in poor condition. Uh, for each driver on Rhode Island, uh, that uh, that situation costs about $845 per year in where um, in terms of the, the poor conditions of the road in Massachusetts is about 620 uh, per driver out here in Oregon where I am uh, we have about 395 uh, bridges that are in need of a repair um, 1287 highway miles in, in uh, poor condition and our average is about 256 uh, dollars uh, per driver so while, while there's some fluctuation there's still significant uh, challenges to 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 American workers and families in terms of the, the poor conditions of the roads that they're dealing with. Uh, so the the bipartisan framework, as I mentioned, uh, is proposing about three hundred twelve billion dollars uh, over that eight, eight year period to address uh, you know the backlog uh, and improvements that need to be made in this critical infrastructure. Obviously, we saw what what was happening in Memphis not too long ago. The secretary, one of the eleven trips that he's made uh, this year so. Far, far really really in the last couple of months i uh, was out to memphis uh, to hear from local officials to hear from business leaders about the challenges that they were faced uh, being faced with with the, the, the i-40 uh, bridge crack um, there's also uh, you know 110 billion uh, in that for for major projects um, uh, in terms of the roads and bridges uh, another piece is the um, sustainable transportation choices um, that are available to folks uh, in Rhode Island, it's uh, it's estimated that it takes folks an extra 120 uh, percent of their time commuting, uh, and in non-white households, uh, it's uh, two and a half times uh, longer to commute by by public transit. Um, 27 percent of the trains and other transit vehicles are past their useful life in in Rhode Island, uh, and as I mentioned in the bipartisan framework. Uh, the president and, and uh, the congressional leaders have have proposed, or at least leaders in the Senate, have proposed about forty nine billion uh, in investment there in public transit, and another sixty six billion uh, in passenger and freight rail. So making sure that 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 rail uh, uh, is a is a, an option uh, for people in terms of uh, their day to day travel uh, to and from work and other places, uh, but also in terms of moving goods and services. 
another piece uh, that's clearly important, uh, again, Rhode Island being a coastal state, uh, between 2010 and 2020, you all experienced about 11 extreme weather events. Um, that cost the state about $2 billion in revenue. Uh, the president's bipartisan framework is, is um, as I mentioned, uh, it, the bipartisan framework that's been worked out with the, the Senate leadership uh, is about $47 billion uh, in investment there. So, again, looking forward to uh, working with, with folks like yourselves across the country to make communities more resilient uh, based on the leadership that the president and, and the Senate is showing. Uh, in terms of uh, clean drinking water and, and, and lead pipes, uh, the president, uh, as part of and I think this is one of those that, that sort of falls into the, the, the soft infrastructure, but I think there was uh, a clear understanding um, with, the, with the Gang of 21 that investment in, in clean drinking water and, uh, and, and reduction of lead pipes across the country was critically important. There's uh, 400,000 schools uh, across, and, and child care centers across the country uh, that don't have uh, adequate uh, water systems. And so over the next 20 years, uh, um, Rhode Island's drinking water infrastructure will require about $833 million uh, worth of additional funding. Uh, the bipartisan uh, infrastructure framework includes $55 billion uh, in investment to ensure that there's clean and safe drinking water in all communities. Uh, so again, we'll look forward to working with our, our partners at EPA and in other uh, federal agencies and uh, the state and local level folks will be implementing uh, initiatives and strategies to ensure that there's clean drinking water available for, for all Americans in every community across the country. Um, and then uh, I'll mention uh, just lastly, because I know we're, we're coming up on time and want to make sure we get to your questions. Uh, you know, the connection to the, the, this, um, the, the reliable uh, high-speed internet piece uh, when it pertains to, to Rhode Island, this was really uh, interesting for me as a, uh, also a former, former teacher, so this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, more than 1.4% uh, of Rhode Islanders uh, live in areas where, uh, by at least one definition, there is no broadband infrastructure that provides uh, minimally acceptable speeds. And so when I think about um, that 1.4% uh, of Rhode Islanders who either uh, from a, a jobs perspective or a health care in terms of telework uh, or for, for young people, for children um, who really needed that critical access, the, that, that, that this has really been uh, a lost year, um, you know, 18 months uh, for so many of them and particularly for the kids who are now uh, so far behind. Uh, and, and so the president uh, and congressional leadership are very committed to making sure that broadband investment uh, is something that happens. Um, about 10 and a half percent of Rhode Islanders live in areas where uh, there's only one provider. So the, the, the issue of competition and some of you may have tracked uh, recently, uh, the president just um, signed into um, uh, signed an executive order on competition. While that's mostly focused on uh, the, our, our global uh, position as a country, uh, in, in terms of competition, uh, I, I think the, the tone has been set to make sure that, uh, that Americans have choice and that there are opportunities uh, to choose um, products and services uh, at affordable rates uh, that provide adequate service, and in this case, uh, broadband access. Um, moreover, even where the, the broadband uh, is available in, in Rhode Island, um, it is, it's far too expensive. So going back to the competition uh, piece, in over 12% of, of Rhode Island households do not have an internet subscription. Um, and so again, the, the president and vice president and the administration are extremely committed to seeing uh, broad access, uh, more available, more ubiquitous uh, throughout the country. Certainly want to see that happen in Rhode Island. Uh, obviously, uh, you all know uh, Commerce Secretary Raimondo very well, given her, her time as, as, uh, as governor of Rhode Island. Uh, she and Secretary Buttigieg uh, are part of a five-person, uh, quote-unquote, jobs cabinet uh, that includes uh, your former uh, neighbor to the north, um, former Mayor Marty Walsh from Boston, who's now Labor Secretary, uh, uh, Secretary Granholm at Energy, and Secretary uh, Fudge at, at HUD. And with that um, uh, cross-functional team, uh, you know, these are the issues that have been um, first and you know, front and center uh, for that group to, to address 
uh, in terms of uh, the infrastructure approach, in terms of the president's vision around the Americans' jobs plan, uh, and making sure that the that those elements of the jobs plan that were most important to to the president and his vision uh, for what the American uh, infrastructure should look like in the 21st century, um, that that was part and parcel of, of what is 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 built into this bipartisan infrastructure framework. Um, and I'll take a, a couple of uh, minutes just to to talk briefly about the. Uh, American Family Plan. I know there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, what's come up in the last couple of days uh, where uh, Senator Schumer announced uh, his push to see a, a three and a half uh, trillion dollar uh, reconciliation bill uh, move forward. And so I can give you, uh, you know, a little bit on um, the contours of, of that conversation to, to the degree that I that I know them. They're not, obviously not all uh, related to Um, to train all of the pieces, sorry, all of the pieces that, that did not make it, or I should say many of the pieces that did not make it into uh, the bipartisan infrastructure framework. Um, so the quote unquote uh, soft infrastructure, uh, the uh, expansion on, on Medicare, uh, you know, child income tax credit, uh, things of that nature. Um, uh, 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 community college investments, et cetera, um, have been rolled into this three and a half trillion dollar uh, reconciliation, uh, budget reconciliation uh, approach that, that Senator Schumer recently announced. Um, and, and I know there's some interest in, in sort of how the two things are tracking. Uh, as of right now, uh, the proposed plan, is, uh, as, uh, as we understand it, is that the, the bipartisan infrastructure framework was just uh, walked through, uh, is supposed to be going uh, to the Senate floor uh, for a motion to proceed uh, next week. And so over the next couple of weeks, uh, that will be where the focus of, of, of action and attention is uh, largely on the Hill. Uh, the, uh, the budget reconciliation um, approach, the three and a half trillion, um, still needs to be um, fully supported by uh, the full Senate caucus uh, in terms of the Democratic caucus. So that does include uh, Senator Sanders from Vermont and Senator uh, King uh, from Maine. Uh, so they would need all 50 of those votes, uh, plus obviously the vice president, uh, to be able to pass that bill to reconciliation, which does not require uh, regular order or, or the 60 vote um, uh, rule that uh, the bipartisan framework um, would also would, would, would have to go through in terms of the Senate. Um, in terms of uh, what's in the, the, the three and a half trillion, uh, as you know, the, the pay fors, as, as we call it, or the, the way that the, the, um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the way that the three and a half trillion dollar reconciliation budget package would be paid for uh, is something that is, you know, clearly up for, for debate and discussion. Uh, the president has proposed paying for uh, his entire package, which originally was around four point one trillion dollars. Um, including the, the AJP and the AFP uh, through a, a combination of uh, raising the corporate tax level from 21% to 28% uh, and also ensuring that no middle class or low uh, income, uh, moderate income uh, Americans would see their taxes raised and so that Americans making over, I believe it was $400,000 uh, a year uh, would pay uh, a, a bit more in, in taxes and, and the Senate um, uh, uh, version of, of, of that uh, Build Back Better uh, proposal in terms of the pay fors uh, has been adopted. You know, some of you have probably tracked uh, Senator Sanders um, has, uh, you know, originally proposed a much larger uh, infrastructure approach around uh, somewhere between six and ten trillion dollars. But he has actually come out publicly in support of uh, the reconciliation uh, you know, as I mentioned, there's still negotiation around what the, the, the bipartisan infrastructure piece will look like. But for, for now, we're hearing generally positive uh, feedback from both the House and Senate uh, on supporting that. And, and still the negotiations are, are, are very fresh now uh, on this newly, uh, at least um, democratically negotiated um, uh, uh, reconciliation package of three and a half trillion dollars. Um, so in terms of some of the, the American family plan elements that are in, in that bill, 
uh, I'll just point out a couple things. Um, so one, uh, the president had proposed about 400 uh, billion for uh, home care and uh, elder care, um, proposed another 213 billion for the retrofit about retrofitting of, of 2 million houses and commercial properties. Um, again, the, the 100 billion in, in broadband access, uh, 100 billion in upgrades to, to public schools throughout the country. Um, you know, water infrastructure investments, about 45 billion, as I mentioned earlier, um, to eliminate lead pipes, 56 for, for drinking water. Um, the president also had proposed uh, 40, 40 billion for public housing projects, about 18 billion for uh, VA hospitals and clinics. Um, let's see what else I think is relevant to you all, about 12 billion for uh, community college uh, infrastructure and uh, 10 billion for uh, federal building modernization, another 10 billion for uh, new workers, public lands and works, uh, waters, excuse me, uh, and about 16 billion uh, in cleanup in, in abandoned mines and uh, plug orphan oil uh, and gas wells. So, um, you know, really a, a broad based sort of approach on uh, the family plan that, that also includes uh, Let's see, he's got 45 billion in there for uh, nutrition uh, programs, about 225 billion uh, for subsidized childcare costs, uh, and about 800 uh, billion, which breaks down in, in tax credits, which breaks down to about 600 billion for the expansion of the, uh, the child, um, child tax credit, and uh, another 200 million for the dependent care uh, tax credit. Uh, so, uh, with that, uh, it, I'll just leave you with, with a couple of uh, quick numbers. Um, the uh, Ipsos did a poll last week on the, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure plan and found that 84% um, of adults across America, regardless of party, uh, were uh, supportive of replacing aging uh, ports, railways, and bridges. So um, the level of funding was something that they agreed with. 76% uh, support uh, investing in the home care, elder care, uh, child care piece, 74% uh, support the broadband investments, 69% uh, support uh, replacing lead pipes, 64% uh, uh, you know, uh, approve of or support the increase of, in taxes on high wage earners and, and corporations. Um, and, and just for, uh, in fairness, 20, 27% oppose those taxes and about 37% say they are willing to pay those higher taxes. So with that, I really appreciate the opportunity to share some information with you and, and hopefully we'll uh, have a few minutes here to take some questions. Uh, Mr. Henderson, that was, uh, that was an amazing uh, heard a force of all aspects of the infrastructure bill. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony DiMatteo, who is the chair of our transportation committee, as I mentioned earlier, to lead a discussion with you with some additional Q&A. Great. And that was outstanding. I have to echo Lori's comments on just the breadth and scope and understanding of the program. And as you were speaking regarding every element of it, or many of the elements of it, um, more and more I became um, in tune and more aware of really the big needs that we have as a nation and also here as a local, you know, community in Rhode Island. Uh, one of the things that, you know, there's a number of things actually I could, I could take 15 minutes outlining them, but, you know, obviously being a coastal state, you know, you know resiliency to climate change and, and sea level change is going to be a major issue. There's been a lot of discussion over the last couple of years regarding in particular Providence's vulnerability to a major event and just sea lot level rising. And, you know, we're talking 20 and 30 years out, having to deal with uh, major improvements to our coastline here to protect the assets in our capital city. Uh, we have a hurricane barrier, for instance, that was built in the 50s. I think it's only been acted one or two times um, and is highly dependent on a big pumping system which we think still works well. I think they test it annually. But uh, in any event, there is one particular area, for instance, where we need uh, to look at a long-term plan. The other area I think that's really critical, and, and the Chamber has been very vocal in working with Senator Reid and Senator Whitehouse regarding the connectivity to Boston. 
and the the need for electrification and upgrading of um, the MBTA uh, trains and the way in which the MBTA system interfaces with Rhode Island and particularly Providence. Uh, we're looking at uh, cycle times, reducing cycle times by uh, 15 minutes in one direction, which we think would have a huge impact not only on you know economic development within our capital city and surrounding communities, but also provide more capacity for uh, residents in and around Boston to access, for instance, uh, TF Green International Airport um, and the local communities down here. So uh, there's so much that needs to needs to happen locally. The other thing that I think is really really important. And this is something that I'm pretty vocal about uh, in our community here in Providence is really the need to transform our our capital investment and our capital investment in public schools. And we have a, a funding program, uh, the first bond tranche of which occurred the last, last gubernatorial election. And we put 100 and something million into a fund, uh, which is spawning investment in a lot of our schools. But I'm, a, I'm one of many who believe that fixing old schools really isn't the answer and that what we need is really transformational, uh, you know, brand new schools for our students, their parents, uh, the administrators, the public in, in general to see happening. And these schools need to be really community based in so many ways. Um, there's I believe there's no greater investment than investing in our young uh, upcoming students in our community. So. I, I like the fact that the Families Act addresses $100 billion in infrastructure for schools, which I think is really critical. So those are some of the issues we have here. I have to take, we have to take our hat off to Mr. Peter Alviti um, and what he has done over the last six years in his position. Uh, when he took office, it was well known throughout the country that our roads and bridges were amongst, if not the worst. And through roadworks and through uh, channeling dedicated funding through our state taxation and our, our, our tolling process here, we've been able to really fund uh, a transformative effort in terms of our roads, but we still need more. So I guess with all this happening and all of these all of these pieces in motion, how do you see the relationship between the federal government and funding this and states being held accountable and being able to measure this change, I guess is as it happens over the next five to eight years and longer, actually. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, so man, the management of it really is something that yeah. fascinates me. No, I, I appreciate uh, the question. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to um, uh, summon my, my friends in the policy shop. I think uh, a lot of what we're seeing is the, um, uh, the needs of, of, of states uh, at one level, but also the, the, the needs of localities. And, and you mentioned Providence and, and sort of the connection to to Boston. And I remember the concept in grad school, this like megalopolis kind of uh, <laughs> thing for, for uh, New England going down all the way down to uh, to D.C. Um, so, you know, the American Conference of Mayors, um, you know, I, I wanted to uh, give a shout out to to your mayor there uh, in Providence, Mayor uh, La Rosa, uh, Lorza, um, who uh, signed on to a letter from the the U.S. Conference of Mayors um, recently, uh, advocating for uh, ensuring that uh, things like the uh, uh, energy efficiency uh, community block grants and um, CBDG grants, generally in and surface transportation. Uh, funding was coming to local areas um, and in terms of uh, how we measure success and failure I think we have uh, new tools uh, we started the raise uh, program which used to be the tiger or used to be the build program which used to be the tiger program which now has uh, a climate and equity component for the first time uh, embedded in it which which will help uh, I think uh, grant grantees uh, recognize and and more effectively measure uh, the success uh, of these uh, investments. Uh, it will no longer just be about you know dollars and cents, but also how does it impact people uh, more fundamentally. And I think that's something that um, certainly my boss, Secretary Buttigieg, uh, espoused during his time on the campaign, and certainly since he's been in this role, uh, making these. Um, these critical investment decisions based on human factors more than just dollars and cents. 
uh, factors. You know, clearly uh, there, there's a role there for that. Um, and, and certainly, you know, one of the things I, I, I didn't mention in, in my, my comments earlier was about the, the way that we we're approaching uh, sort of infrastructure investment from the triple P or the, the public private partnership um, perspective. Um, the secretary and, and I sometimes refer to it as the, 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 the four P's. Uh, public, private, um, and people uh, partnership uh, in terms of that level of investment. So uh, to answer your question, Anthony, I think uh, a number of, of uh, accountability tools are, are being put in place now. We are certainly at the federal level learning from what certain states and, and cities and localities are doing uh, really well and want to be in a position to amplify that and, and scale it um, uh, at the national level. Great. Super. So I, I know one of the um, things talked about in the infrastructure bipartisan infrastructure bill was a, an investment bank, an infrastructure financing authority, and uh, along with some of the different concepts around uh, spawning investment in such as private public partnerships and um, you know construction bonds and things of that such. So I was wondering if there was any more you could lend to the infrastructure financing authority, maybe some idea in terms of how that might function in how it might be organized so we could you know gain a little insight around that sure i know i know that uh it is it is in the the infrastructure um framework uh it's proposed i should say in the infrastructure framework uh some of you are probably tracking it closer than, than i personally am there was a, i know there was a house bill last year i think it was hr uh 6, 6422 um, that that essentially uh, reestablished the, the 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 concept of an infrastructure bank. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that the the president recognizes as we have you know transportation trust funds for certain pieces of our transportation system. Uh, um, that an infrastructure bank uh, that would be there uh, to help to to catalyze and stimulate. Uh, some of these investments and then compound on uh, private sector investments. And you mentioned some of the local investments that are being made. And I, I certainly, as a, a former mayor's chief of staff, want to give a shout out to uh, communities uh, that are trying to find uh, solutions on their own because, you know, frankly, the, the federal government has not um, traditionally in the last several years always been the most effective uh, partner in, in many ways. And so one of the things that I know the president um, and vice president are very committed to uh, in this administration is making sure that the, the federal government steps up and that we participate in, in, in a way that is meaningful and impactful um, for communities. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the first four sort of, quote, infrastructure banks were uh, critically important, you know, going back to, to President Lincoln and President Roosevelt and, and building out the canals and the Transcontinental Railroad um, and the Hoover Dam and, and, and bringing, you know, quote, electrification to the country. Um, and this notion of electrifying uh, our grid so that we can support uh, transportation choices that are cleaner uh, and more sustainable and, and resilient is something that the, the president sees as a really important factor uh, in the infrastructure bank. But, you know, right now that's still being negotiated uh, in Congress and with the White House and, and certainly more to come there. Yeah, that's great. I think uh, a couple of other just thoughts. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion recently, again, about clean nuclear. And I know that's sort of been a third rail in terms of, you know, public side of things in terms of our country. Um, but I, I don't know if, you know, the technology's changed dramatically and it is being used in different parts of the world on a very effective basis. So um, there's certainly, from what I'm reading and understanding, there's, you know, obviously the days of carbon uh, emissions are, are, you know, are behind us in terms of growth and, you know, you know, cap and trade and, and taxing carbon, I think is, is obviously going to be, um, more and more evident as we move forward with for, for good reason in terms of beginning to shift um, you know how we look at um, sustaining our society and and becoming more um, resilient and energy efficient which is wonderful to see um, and the other thing that I think is really fascinating is if you look at the investment you know with with the highway system back in the 50s under Eisenhower and you look at the benefit that that's had to our country in terms of economic growth. Um, I think you know the alignment is pretty pretty positive here in terms of what this bill, bipartisan bill, and some of the other elements of the resolution 
budget resolution can do for our country moving forward in a way that can really propel us to stay as a leader economically and, and socially throughout the world for the next 100 years or more. So uh, hats off to you and, and the secretary and others uh, who are working diligently to see that this happens. We think it's all very important here in Rhode Island and uh, amongst the members of the chamber um, and personally, you know, all of us that are on this call today. So I want to thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the opportunity. I, I very much appreciate it and look forward to uh, continuing to work with you all and um, hopefully gathering support to, to make the push to, to get the both the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the, and the president's broader vision around uh, build, his Build Back Better agenda uh, across the finish line in, in, in the House and Senate. Great. Super. Lori? Thank you, Anthony. Um, Maurice, I just had one follow-up question. I know Anthony has um, done a fantastic job um, really keying in on uh, some of the, the, um, the more specific aspects of the infrastructure bill pertaining to Rhode Island, but I did want to ask you about the uh, community college uh, provisions of the, um, of the new bipartisan bill. Well, I, I won't claim to be the, the expert on it, but um, as I understand what the president proposed, um, uh, essentially waiving uh, the, the, the cost um, for community college for, for students across the country, uh, the president is very interested and, in, in, you know, frankly, we've spent um, a, a number of, of hours over the last several weeks of the secretary's time particularly, but, but certainly staff time. Uh, dealing with uh, issues around uh, workforce readiness and training, and uh, the president and vice president, Secretary uh, Buttigieg, and, and certainly Secretary uh, Walsh, uh, feel very strongly about uh, the, the, the place that community colleges uh, have in preparing uh, our workers who may not choose college as their pathway, and, 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 uh, but still wanting to level up on their skills um, as an opportunity. And so the president has proposed and and certainly the, the Senate Democrats, at least to date, um, have supported um, pushing through uh, uh, funding to ensure that, that that community college is free for every American who wants to, to, wants to attend it. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. And um, I wanted to uh, offer my reaction on the C minus infrastructure grade. Uh, when you started talking about the, the grading process, I. I was wincing a little bit. Uh, I thought you were going to um, give a much more, or report a much more draconian grade for Rhode Island. Uh, but I agree with Anthony's comments that C minus is an amazing grade. And Governor Gina Raimondo, then Governor Gina Raimondo and Transportation Secretary Peter, um, Peter Albedi, uh have done a remarkable job uh, on the roads and bridges and um, President Biden did come to Rhode Island a number of years ago. Uh, I was there. We did the uh, um, a rally around roadworks and uh, talked about the dire need for improved roads and bridges in Rhode Island. So the C minus grade, I think, is uh, is is pretty good. Yeah, I you know, I, I think that uh, there are certainly parts of the country that should be be proud of the investments that they've made. Um, but but obviously there's a lot that we can do better, and, and that's what the president and, and vice president have proposed in this. And again, let me thank you, Lori, and you, Anthony, for the gracious opportunity to speak with you and your membership. And you know, please uh, feel free to reach out if there's anything that we can do in terms of providing information. And, and certainly, I uh, I can't tell you how to do it, but uh, would certainly <laughs> love the, the chamber's support in, in making sure that. Uh, uh, folks in Rhode Island and, and in uh, the greater Providence region understand the importance of, of what the president uh, has proposed here and in, in his uh, Build Back Better agenda, what, what's in the bipartisan infrastructure framework, and, and certainly what's in the uh, larger reconciliation package. Great. Thank you very much, Adam well, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. Us, uh, Anthony DiMatteo. We have been live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for episode number 138 of Chamber TV. Thank you, everybody, for watching and for participating, and we thank our special guests. See you thank again. You. Thank you.